Father, I just thank you for um, I thank you for Josh's message. I don't know what it is, but Lord, I just uh, pray that you use it to um, speak to us. Father, I pray that as we sing and lift our voices to you, that we bring honor and glory to you, Lord. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, to come together as believers and to share and encourage each other. Father, I just thank you for all that you do. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's worship our God together. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you, cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Stumble again. I'm caught in your grace. 
everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. Yes, Lord, we ask that you would be here this morning with us. Help us to lay down everything we've been holding on to all week, Lord. Let us focus on you alone right now. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. In my heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. I am happy from the inside out. And from the outside in, I am firmly formed. You canceled my ticket to hell. That's not my destination anymore. Psalm 16, 9. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, everlasting, your light Shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all faith. And the cry of my heart is to bring new praise from the inside out, Lord. My soul cries out from the inside out, Lord. My soul cries out. can wash away our sins what can make us whole again nothing but the blood nothing but the blood of Jesus what can wash us pure as snow Welcome as the friends of God, nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, Jesus. Your blood speaks a better word. All the empty claims I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood.
Testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach, not earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. What can wash us? All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. Psalm 86, 9 through 11. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Yes, Lord, you are great. We worship you this morning. And when I think that God is Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing. He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior.
give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. I pray that's true for you. It's true for me. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow with humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul. seat. Children, come on up. How much is three inches. Can you show me on your hand? Do you know how much it is? How much do you think it is? That's about an inch. That's about a quarter of an inch. That's about an eighth of an inch. That's like two feet. Okay? Okay? So about three inches is probably about this much here. Okay? Now, one of the things that I like is the rain. Did we have a good rain this past week? Yeah. Thursday, it rained hard. Do you know how much it rained? A lot. Do you know how much a lot is in Winslow? A little more about that much. It rained just a little bit more than half of an inch. I love the rain. I live in the worst city in the world <laughs> to have rain. Do you know Winslow's like in the top 10 of the driest weather stations in the country? It's really, it's like, I think it's number six. But check out what I have. What is that? There's one of these by the law. Behind, this is not the one behind the library. Um, but if you look real closely in the bottom, what can you see? A fly. And it looks like sand. So there's dirt in there. Winslow, we can measure the dirt blowing. But you know what? On Thursday, we actually had, I was so excited. I came home. And I'll show you how much, where's it at? So it rained, and it collects it, and it makes it look big. I'm filling up how much it rained. Ah, it went too much. It filled my thing up, almost, you know, just a little bit less than that. 
Okay, so it rained on, actually it didn't, I didn't go quite high enough. That's how high it was on Wednesday, on Thursday. Okay, I stood outside the whole time. Um, <laughs> I was drenched by the, by the end of the evening or the end of the afternoon, but that's how much rain it went. So it didn't even rain a whole inch. Now, some places get, you know, it'll rain two or three. If you watch the news, especially like in Oklahoma and Texas and, you know, Mississippi and stuff, it may rain two or three inches in a day. Doesn't happen here, okay? This is a good rain. And we usually get about six or seven inches of rain a year. But you know what? What happens if you get a lot of rain? It might get flooded. Okay, that's the downside. What's the good side of that? Yeah, well, it dries up. In fact, it was weird on Thursday. It's like it was really rainy and floody in the streets. An hour later, they're dry. Literally dry. Because we live in a desert, okay? It waters your plants. If, we, if it rained all the time in Winslow, what do you think we would have? We'd probably have trees, we'd have grass, um, we'd have bushes, we'd have ticks and chiggers, okay, <laughs> snakes, uh, mosquitoes, okay, we have mosquitoes sometimes, but not too much. But here's what I thought was interesting, it's like, I love the rain, and whenever, I, whenever it rains, I'm always so thankful to God. Say, God, thank you for sending us rain. I like it when it's this. Now, here's what's really beneficial with my nifty rain gauge. And a friend of mine sent this to me because he looked at mine because I kept taking pictures of it. He goes, yours is pitiful, and you can't tell how much is there. But you know what? Even when we get just a little bit, I can tell how much we got. And so I've been keeping track this year, and we are at... Two inches, 2.79 inches of rain so far. Okay, not very much. Uh, hopefully we get about four more inches between now and the end of the year. But it, we don't get a lot of rain here. But when we get a little bit, I'm even thankful for a little bit. So here's what uh, Zechariah 10.1 says. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain from the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation in the field. So God's the one that sends the rain. We just need to ask him for more. You know, I was, I think it was Tuesday, I was outside and I was looking at the rain saying, Lord, we just need more rain. And Thursday, he's like, boom, here you go. And I was excited about that. Okay. So I just love the rain. Okay. And it's just so, and I don't have to water the yard either when that happens. So that's that's really a beautiful. You like lightning? You don't like lightning? I don't want it to hit me, but I like to see it. Okay, I think I think it looks cool. Okay, not not in the lightning. Okay, let's pray, and I'll let you <laughs> go to children's time and and back to your seats. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the rain, for the nourishment you give our, our land. And, Father, I thank you that uh, no matter what issues it causes with traffic or, you know, around town or leaky roofs, Lord, um, I just pray that you uh, help us to understand that you're blessing us with your rain. And, Father, I just thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Just be with these uh, young children and kids um, as they live for you and serve you, I just pray that you draw them close to you. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Oh. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, probably not the best week of the year to try to fix a roof. I'm sitting there on an aluminum ladder swinging a metal hammer looking up at all this thunder and lightning. It's like, this probably isn't intelligent. <laughs> but, um, God's good. We got it done.
Um, before Josh comes up, I just wanted to give a quick word of tribute and um, goodbye uh, to a member of our, a couple members of our church um, who have been here for a very long time, all the way back when I was in kindergarten. Um, I had a teacher that, when my memory serves me, um, she wasn't entirely pleasant. Uh, she and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And the one thing that made that year bearable of kindergarten was this teacher had a teacher's aid that was absolutely wonderful. And uh, Imelda Parrish uh, really came to my rescue more than once. And she has been so supportive to our church ministry in my entire memory. I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, uh, the, the parish family, they would just like take a whole row of, of uh, the whole pew in church services because of Irvin and Amelda's passion and compassion for children. And that has carried all the way through their life to where she has been. Uh, they've constantly been involved in children's ministry. Um, I remember Imelda, uh, when she was in her 70s, going to be one of our uh, sponsors to go to children's camp. And uh, just her and Irvin's faithfulness through the years have been so appreciated. Uh, but at the same time, it makes it much more difficult that this is their last Sunday. Um, they are going to be moving with their family um, to live closer to family, and so they're leaving uh, before you see them next week. So, Irvin and Amelda, thank you so much for your many, many, many years of being a part of our church. And can I just say, let's break this tradition now to where I have to keep coming up and saying goodbye to people. We said goodbye to Linda last week, saying goodbye to the parishes this week. It stops here, okay? Stop that. Knock that off. But we do want to surround them with lots of uh, hugs and, and uh, warm wishes as they leave today. Now, I'm so excited that I'm capable of taking a whole week off and doing something like a roof because we have somebody um, that... I have lots of people, actually, that I can ask to preach for me. Um, God has just really blessed our church with that. And I told Josh, uh, I asked Josh right away because I just really enjoy hearing how God uses them. So, Josh, thank you so much for today. Come on up. Appreciate you getting away from Multiply Church for a week. Thank, thank your dad for letting us have you for a week. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, so first thing I want to kind of mention here is uh, one year ago today, actually, is when we moved here. So uh, it's pretty cool just to have been part of this community. Um, I got to say, like, just being part of the body of Christ here, uh, you guys were incredibly welcoming. And uh, it's not Multiply Church. It's not FBC. It's, it's God's church. And I'm just, I'm so blessed. Our family is so blessed by you guys. I've just been thinking about this past year and all the families that have blessed us and welcomed us um, and also blessed Multiply Church. And obviously, it would not be here without you guys. So I just want to say thank you to you guys. Um, glory to God. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. So we're really blessed um, by you. And it's our one-year wedding anniversary next week. So it's pretty, pretty exciting stuff. But... So thank you guys. Uh, thank you for being there last year too. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, I'm going to pray really quick and then uh, we'll start. So God, thank you. Uh, thank you for this amazing church. Thank you for your church. I pray you just get me out of the way today. Um, it says your word. Uh, Jesus gave the spirit in your word when he went up to be with the father and he gave us peace when he did that. So I pray you give me peace through your word and your spirit this morning. I pray you just let your words speak um, to this church. I pray it's a challenge um, for us and a challenge for Multiply and all the churches in the community here. Um, we just thank you for your word. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. All right, so go ahead and open your Bibles up to John chapter 1. Um, we're going to be talking about something that's pretty basic in the Christian culture and church, um, and that is the word is God. Um, so we're going to get into that. A little bit, but to start, I want to bring up something controversial already, I know, but it's a, it's a different kind of controversial, and that is my favorite teacher growing up. 
For some of you who know, my mom was my teacher, um, my seventh and eighth grade teacher. And unfortunately, by my own fault, she is not my favorite teacher. I was a terrible student for my mom. Um, I'm sorry, mom. It, it, was, it was a hard two years. So um, we made it through it as a family. But my favorite teacher was actually my third grade teacher. His name was Mr. Hawking. Um, he, was, he was just really cool. He was, uh, he was younger for a teacher. Um, he was the only male teacher at our school. Uh, and he played basketball with us every single day. Uh, he was just an awesome guy. Um, but he taught third graders. So, I mean, those of you who have third graders or who have taught third graders, also you're like, well, that makes him pretty awesome as well because that's a hard age, nine-year-old, eight-year-old. Like, that's a hard, hard age to teach. But he did it, and it was fun, and he was our history teacher, and I love history. So all of those things stacked up to him being my favorite teacher. Um, he also... Uh, he introduced Steve Nash to me as a kid, and like in that generation, like 2008, like he was big then, and I loved basketball as a kid, so uh, he just, he played basketball with us every day, and that was really cool. But one of the crazy things he did with us is a bunch of third graders, he had us memorize the entire first chapter of John, which is like, I don't think I could ever make a third grader memorize the first two verses, especially because they're hard. Um, so try and do that with high schoolers now. I mean, it wouldn't happen. So uh, it's, just, it's just something he did. I, I, can't, I can't recite the whole thing now. Um, I, I've forgotten uh, the end of it, but uh, that's why we have the Bible, so we can go back and read it. Um, but I was kind of thinking about that this week. This is probably the most amount of difficulty I've had writing a sermon. I don't know why. Uh, I just, I, I had a hard time, I guess, understanding some basic things, and I was going to preach on something else in John, and I was like, I can't move past John 1 first, though, and we're going to be in John 1 and John 14 today, but it's that idea is the Word is God, so we're going to go ahead and read uh, John chapter 1, 1 through 4. A lot of you memorize this yourself, so in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, one, it's universally known. That's kind of confusing. Um, and one of the reasons, especially for kids, is the wording of it. Um, the wording of the word, uh, we're going to say the word a lot today. So if like you had a counter, it's probably going to be like 200 times I'm going to say that. But... Uh, yeah, the wording of it is confusing, but once you sort it out and you study, it's actually pretty straightforward, but the concept is what I'm, I've been struggling with. Um, that concept is the word is God. What does that mean? Uh, in a lot of ways, the word being God, my first kind of question, especially as a kid, is like, for a kid to understand it, my first understanding of it in my own mind was, well, the word is God like God is good. So a description in a lot of ways, like, Obviously, that's true. The Word describes God, and God describes the Word. Um, but what does it mean that the Word is God? So I have some initial questions, um, I guess, that were in, was in my head. Um, and then kind of we'll study, and those will kind of be the points later. So let, let's go to the questions here. All right, so. Sorry. There we go. All right. So, we know the Word is God through His written Word. In fact, that's how we know any of these things. So, the foundation of our belief lies within the doctrines of the Bible. Um, so, it's kind of it's funny how we know the Word is the Word because of the Word itself. But we know it's the Word itself because of the foundation of it. The fact that the Word is not contradicted through the entirety of the Bible. The fact that the cross-references um, are impossible to accomplish um, throughout history and then obviously the prophecies through Jesus. Um, so we have this kind of idea. Now there's a doctrine throughout the Christian church now, and it's been here for a long time. It's called sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is scripture alone. That's what that means. And that's what this church believes. That's what Multiply believes. That's what the Christian church believes, and that is the word is your foundation, right? And it's not the opposite view of sola ecclesia, which is the church alone. So what's your authority? The word alone, the church alone. We believe the word is your authority alone. 
Now, the word is God. We're going to get into that more. But that is why it's the authority. It's because it is God. The problem with the church alone is this. One, men is fallible. God is not. God is not fallible. The word is not fallible. Other problem is, whenever you get to talking to someone, I know someone who is talking to a Jehovah's Witness this week. And Jehovah's Witness, whenever you present the contradictions from what they have to what the word says, it goes back to, well, my personal revelation actually says this. I've experienced this. I can't, I can't say anything else to that. This is my own experience. Well, how do you beat that? How do you beat someone else's experience? I have my own experiences. You guys have your own experiences, right? Well, the word of God. That is how you beat that. Uh, there's no way around it. It's not about your own personal experience above the word of God. Now, Jesus, in, in the, him sending the Spirit, blesses you in your personal experience through the, the Spirit and the sanctification of the Spirit through the word. But the word is a foundation. So the question here is, is the word like God? Or is it a description? Or is the word a personification of God? If God is the word then the word is carried through the Father, Son, and Spirit, or is it just Jesus? Because in the beginning of John, it just talks about Jesus being the word. But if the word is God, what does it really mean? That God, obviously, we know that God is the Father, Son, and Spirit, but he's also the word. So how is the word the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? That's what we're kind of going to get into today. Now, this is both, the reason why those topics, the Trinity and the word, correlate so well is because the Bible never actually says the word Trinity. It's not specifically, well, it is specifically described, but it's not specifically said, this is this, and this is what it means. So here's the difference between sola ecclesia and sola scriptura, the word alone versus church alone. Now, church tradition is a great thing. We have that here. We have that at Multiply. We have that at many churches here. Um, for example, the order of having a church service is very common tradition right? But we have to ask, why do we do these things? Do we do them because the church says it's okay, or it's a good thing? Actually, ultimately, no, we don't. We do it because it's based on the word. That is the biggest difference between sola ecclesia, sola scriptura. The reason why I bring that up is a challenge for my own self. I grew up in the church. That is a very hard thing for someone who grew up in the church because we take these truths, and because we grew up in the church, we know them as truths. For example, the Word is God, the Trinity. But why do we, we don't take those as truths because the church says to. That's the biggest problem. So that's my biggest challenge for a lot of you who grew up in the church, who have been in the church for a long time, is what does it mean, the Trinity? What does it mean the Word is God, right? It's because the Bible says so, and we're going to get into that. But don't believe something just because the church says it. Believe it because the Word says it. And obviously, the amazing thing about Fred's teachings and the other people who teach here is they base their teachings on the Word. That is the standard that Fred has for people teaching here. And so that's, that's the amazing thing about God's Word is it's our ultimate standard. I know that was a long kind of intro, but now we're going to get back into it. So, um, yeah, you don't really get shorter messages, I guess. You don't get a, you don't get a leave early when I, I'm here. So... Uh, Verses 16 and 17, we're going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, that's still John 1 here. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we're going to go through 1 through 4 and 16 and 17. They correlate pretty well here. So verse 2 in John 1 says, He was in the beginning with God. Um, we kind of miss it here. Verse 2 is actually very clear. First question answered. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Who's he? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So he is the word. There you go. So that, that's, that's something that I kind of skipped a lot growing up, even though we had it memorized. But because you memorize something, sometimes you just, yeah, I know that verse. I know that verse. But really, the verse is God as the personification of God. It is not a description alone of God. And then verse 3 says, All things are made through him, and without him nothing, not anything was made that has been made. So a lot of times people quote just verse 3 from, from John 1. And the thing is, if you read it from an English perspective, who's the subject here still? It's still the word. So it says, All things are made through him, and without him was not anything that has been made. 
So it's obviously talking about God, but it's still talking about the word. So that everything that's been made was made through the word. So that's just a really interesting concept. But it's also, it's good to note the power of the word of God. And I'm not just talking about whenever he just specifically speaks, that's written down in the Bible. But the entire word of God is in the Bible, but also what God calls us to do is just as powerful as the word of God who called creation into being. So we need to take that very seriously. What is Jesus? What is God? What does the Spirit have the job for us? It's all very powerful. So the word is life and light, which is revealed as Jesus as the life and light. You read later in John 1, it reveals John the Baptist is talking about who? The light. The light is Jesus. The, yes, exactly, right? We actually sang that in that, the second song today about the light. Um, when everything else fades away, the light is the center, right? The light is what guides us. So also, though, another big amen, the light is also the word because Jesus and the word are the same. It obviously very specific about the light being the word. That's harder because we hear Jesus is the light. He saved me. Amen, right? The word is the light. That is every day. This is how you're guided every day through the word. That's, that's just as amazing as Jesus, as him saving us from our sins. But he also gave us a guidance, and that's the word. So in him was life. John uses that descriptions, uh, this kind of like in, uh, in him was life. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a confusing description that John uses throughout the entire book of John, but it's kind of a theme that he creates, which God creates. Um, and it's really cool because he's using the same um, speech as, as he uses in the Trinity. In him was life. I am in the Father. It's they are the same. They are in one. Now, that's something that we can understand as a church because we understand the Trinity. But also, I want you to expand that to the word is that same concept as the Trinity. As the Father is in the Son, the Son is in the Spirit, the God is in the Word. It's the same thing. So that's kind of cool for, for a church who understands that. A lot of you are nodding your heads. It makes it an easier thing to understand. So, the Word became flesh. That's verse 14 in John 1 as well. This section is specifically talking about Jesus. So, it's very obvious to us now. Jesus is the Word. John 1, go read it yourself later. Jesus is the Word. That's kind of the first check mark there. Very understood, um, very basic. But how is the word more? So Jesus is the light to guide in the darkness. So is the word, like I said. So how do we back that up, though? Um, I would uh, go ahead and turn to John 12 now. John 12, verse 34. So we're going to be... I know it seems like we're flipping around a lot, but we're going to be in John 1, 12, and 14. So the crowd answered him. I'll let you still hear pages flipping there. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the, the, the crowd addressing Jesus when he's talking. And they ask him a question. And it's kind of cool to see how he answers this question. Because when you read it the first time, it doesn't really seem like he answers it. Not how we want it anyway, but he does answer it in a really cool way. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. So the law is their word. This is all they have. Law and the prophets, right? So the law, remember that. We have heard from the word, the law, that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So they're saying, their question is, You're supposed to be here forever. Why are you being lifted up? I don't get it. So his answer is, the light is among you for a little while longer. While you walk, you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. So this is really interesting here because John, who's wrote, who has written John chapter 1 already, if you read this in context, we're now in John 12, Jesus answers their question. But it's not how they under, it's, it's kind of confusing if they don't understand the theme throughout what Jesus is communicating. So they say, you're supposed to be here forever. Why are you going? And Jesus says, well, I'll be among you for a little while longer. Now, this is him talking to the audience. This isn't him specifically talking to us. Sometimes we read and we want it to apply to us right now, but we need to read to the audience he's, he's speaking to first. So the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. 
lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. So, he's talking to them. He says, I'm going to be with you. I am the light for a little while longer. Now, believe in me while I'm here, right? So, that's kind of confusing because they said, you're supposed to be here forever, right? But John 1 says Jesus is the light, but it says the word is the light. So, the light is not really going. It's just Jesus is going. And obviously, we see the apostles, they have light, we have light, but Jesus is with the Father. So we're going to kind of go into that more. Um, this is for, obviously, he's speaking to non-believers as well. Um, believe that you may become sons of light. So it's just, it's just kind of an interesting thing to hold on to while we go into John 14, um, because it doesn't really seem like he answers the question at first, but he will later. And the word can't contradict itself, right? The Christ remains forever. He does remain forever. We know that now, but how do they know that? So this is kind of the final um, big point here through the scripture. And the word is God. Obviously, we know that. But the, the Father writes and commands, the Son fulfills, the Spirit preserves and sanctifies. That is how the word is God. Um, and that's what it's written about. But we're going to get into why I, I'm saying that. It, it's scripturally based. So... John 14, 8, um, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Oh, I'll let you get there, sorry. Verse 8, uh, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. It's a big question. Uh, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still not know me, Philip? So he said, show us the Father. And he said, do you not know me? Interesting. Um, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So that that theme that John is writing through this gospel, um, it comes up again. This is my scriptural basis to the Father writes and commands, and Jesus fulfills, right? So... Um, he doesn't speak on his own authority. He speaks on, on the Father's authority. The Father who dwells in me does his works. So, um, obviously, the Father also, through the Old Testament, and that's an amazing thing about the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, um, he's written this down. He's made a commandments for us. Jesus is going to talk on those two later. But God, the Father, has written and commanded. So he's the word from the beginning, just as Jesus is, too, But this idea that Father is the Word, this is really all they know up to this point. The Gospels are that first starting point from Malachi. So all these people have is the Law and the Prophets. And then Jesus here is saying, I am the Father too, and I'm going to do His will based on His authority. What does Jesus say in Matthew 15? I am the Law. I have not come to abolish the Law, but to fulfill it. Right? I am the Law and the Prophets. Um, So Jesus is fulfilling the Word of God. Uh, Jesus is the light and the life. The word is the light and the life as well. Um, we, I keep bringing that up, but it's really important for later. Uh, so the last thing, too, is not my will but yours. Before Jesus goes to the cross in just a few chapters from here, um, he says, not my will, Father, but your Father. The Father's commanded it, and the Jesus is fulfilling it. So now go to verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them... Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, who's not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. All right. So that's that's probably one of the biggest... um, hits in in the book of john um where the disciples are like 
I don't know if they're starting to understand, but they're at least asking a little bit better question than, where's the Father, Jesus? Um, so obviously, Philip and the disciples have come a little bit farther in a few chapters. But this is the introduction of the Holy Spirit as the Word as well. Um, this role that the Holy Spirit has is Jesus' gift to us as the church now. Um, this is kind of the amazing thing between the relationship because I've been talking a lot about the God, the Father, and God the Son, but I haven't brought up the Spirit that much yet. So those who love Jesus keep the Father's commandments. Those who love Jesus keep his word, right? And Jesus will manifest himself in them through the Spirit. So Jesus is sending the Helper, right? And the Helper will sanctify us. But the biggest thing is, how does the helper sanctify us? By what standard? Because if the helper sanctifies you, but you also are sanctified because you love God, and because you love God, you love his word, the helper, the Holy Spirit, sanctifies you through the word. There's a standard for morality here. There's a standard for why we feel conviction. And this is what separates us with the Holy Spirit compared to these other beliefs that oh no, God spoke to me too, and now this is, this is what he says, and this is um, where I get my right and wrong. We say, over here, we say, we have the Spirit who sanctifies us and manifests himself in us, but the standard is God's word from the beginning of time. That is a lot bigger than just, oh, I feel this feeling in me, and that's how I really ultimately know what right and wrong is, because obviously there's some mistakes here and here, but really I know this feeling, so this is where my belief comes from. I don't want anybody to have a belief that, that's found, founded in their own feeling. And that is the beautiful gift that Jesus leaves after he dies on the cross and resurrects. That is just as much a victory to me as the resurrection itself. Because Jesus gives us a gift that's way bigger than what a lot of people had before that too. Um, a lot of times when I was a kid, I remember reading like the Old Testament and thinking, Man, they had God the Father, like, directly speaking to them right there. They had it so much better than us sometimes. Like, sometimes we have those thoughts, and I used to have those thoughts. Or they had Jesus with them right there. Like, he says, I'm the light. Believe in me right now. I'm right here, and you'll be saved. But then Jesus says the equally powerful thing of, I'm giving you the word, and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you, right? That is the peace that we get from Jesus and the Father himself, so why does all this matter? I know, obviously, we know why it matters. But there's a couple takeaways here. One, without the word, we do not know God. So we have the spirit working with God. That is the, the powerful thing there. Um, this is how we know God. So we have a lot of Bible studies here, right? That is one of the coolest things about this church is we have an ability to learn and know God through the body of Christ and through the spirit. But there's another reason to know the word. And this is something that a lot of Christians miss because when we go to study the Bible, we go and think, well, how does this apply to me? I want to know God. Obviously, we all want to know God. But there's another reason why we know God through the word. And that reason is because we want to know God so we can share God with people. You can only share God with people if you know him well. Um, and how do we know him well is through the word. We kind of do something at Multiply at the end of, of the sermons. It's called Monday Matters. Um, and it, it's kind of basic, but I, I don't want to skip past that. And that is, what's your tomorrow look like? Why am I here today for this church this morning? It's for tomorrow. It's not for next week. It's not for next year. It's for tomorrow. It's for Monday. So when it, whenever you guys go and study the word tonight, whenever you go tomorrow, I guarantee there's a Bible study tomorrow, right? I'm, I'm sure there's one at some point, which is amazing. Um, why are you going to that Bible study, right? My challenge for you is to stop studying the Bible with yourself at the center. And I know it's, it's kind of a harsh thing to hear, but the Bible's about Jesus. The Bible's about God. The word is God. Whenever you go to study the Bible, we need to approach it that way. We can't make ourselves God. We don't realize it, but we do that a lot. Um, when we go to study, when we go to pray, it's all about ourselves. The thing is, is 
the command Jesus actually leaves when he says, here's the spirit, here's the word, does he say, okay, now go on your own and just see how it applies to you? No, he doesn't do that. What's he say? He says, peace be with you. Here's the spirit. Here's the word. Go out and make disciples. That's what he says. Here's the tools. Here's the strength. Here's the peace. Go do the hardest things you can do in your entire life because it is very hard. But this is how you do it. You don't do it on your own strength. Whenever it says we don't do it on our own strength, this is why, because of the spirit and the word. That's the important part of it. Whenever we start to try and do things on our own strength, we fail over and over again. That's the difference between sola scriptura, sola ecclesia, right? So another thing here, though. Multiply and FBC, they have the same goal, right? Um, that's to make disciples. But the th most theologically advanced person in the world is just a small spark if he shares with nobody. But the one who knows the words of Jesus and shares it with everyone they love in their life is a beacon of light for all of us. We need to rely on the word for knowledge of God above everything else. But the thing is, sometimes what we do is either one, we just want to have all this head knowledge so much that we just internalize it and it's for our own pride. Or even worse, we go to outside sources and we leave the Bible alone. We're like, I don't need this. I can do this to convince people about God. The thing is, the Bible is very clear about we come to know God, and they come to know God through his word. So when we share the gospel with people, all you need to know is the book of John. That's why I'm preaching on it today. Obviously, super beneficial to know the whole Bible, and none of us can truly know the whole thing. But when we go to share the gospel with people, this is your foundation. For example, atheist friend at work. Where does his morality come from? Where does his standard for good and evil come from? It, it doesn't come from anywhere, honestly, because why? Well, one reason is we're all just descendants of slime and bacteria, right? What does one descendant of slime and bacteria have to do with another descendant of slime and bacteria, right? Nothing. It doesn't matter at all. You could do whatever you want to anybody because in the broad scheme of things, it doesn't matter. Well, then his answer would probably be, well, society determines right and wrong. Well, if that's true, then slavery 200 years ago was right, and that's not good, right? So now, where do you go from there? Well, easy. God says we're made in his own image. We have value. Jesus loves you, and he made you with value, and he wants you to know him. That's how you have the standard for the gospel. There's many other ways to approach different beliefs, right? We, a lot of times, we like to run on our own head knowledge of, of the evidence of creation or the evidence um, of Jesus, the historical evidence, which is really good. That's not a bad thing, but don't abandon the word first. The word is your foundation. You can use the evidence to get there. Like people always challenge, well, the Bible's fallible. It was just translated 20 times before we got here. Actually, no, we have 5,000 copies of the Old Testament in original Greek, and then we translate those to now, right? That's helpful knowledge to know. But past that, you still need to know the Bible to share it with them. If you can know all about the evidence of the Bible, but not know the Bible itself, we've all failed, right? So I want to encourage you guys, when you go to study the Bible, when you go to learn about who God is, your thought should be, I want to know who you are, and I can't wait to share it with my non-Christian friend. Because we, even in my head, a lot of times, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I can't wait to share this on a sermon, or I can't wait to share this in Bible study, Amazing, right? Because when you share in Bible study, now they know this really cool thing about God too. But also, your major thought should be, I can't sh wait to share this amazing love God has for me for someone who doesn't know that yet. They don't know God. They don't know God has a love for them. So my challenge for you is know the word so that people can know the word. Know the word so you can know God. Know God so they can know God, right? So that's kind of all I have today. Actually, I didn't take too long, so that's good. But um, I just want to encourage you guys. In your Bible study this week, I have a practical challenge. Um, have an unbeliever in your life. I know that's hard sometimes, but there's 5,000 people here, and we don't have enough churches to reach them yet, right? That's why we have so many churches. That's a blessing. That's a good thing. There's got to be an unbeliever in your life. And you want to share that at Bible study. Guys, I have this person in my life. I want to share the gospel with them. 
Help me use the word to do that. That's a beautiful thing about Bible study. That's a beautiful thing about having people in your life, like my friend Chance over there. Chance, I have this friend. I don't, here's how the conversation went. I don't really know, you know, I, I don't think it went as well as I wanted it to go. My friend in Christ can say, well, I think I know you, a few verses from God who can help you with that. So I want to challenge you guys. Have an unbeliever in your life and ask for help in your Bible study and share about that unbeliever so they can pray for them too. So I'm going to close here. I'm going to pray for us. Um, I just want to say thank you for listening today, but uh, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Uh, I pray that my confusing words um, were understood somewhat today. Uh, I pray that you just challenge all our hearts today. I thank you for such an amazing church to have um, just the ability to reach the community in the way that they can. Um, there's so many things going on right now all the time, um, and they're always reaching the community. So I pray that you just put on every person's heart um, this week that Monday matters tomorrow. And I pray that uh, you just touch everybody's hearts uh, when they read your word um, so that they can share it with others. Uh, I pray you just bless our week today. I pray you give us a hunger for you and to know you. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Josh. In our culture today, we have done this weird divide between this ambiguous, fluffy idea of faith in a higher power that can give you comfort and strength and divided that from the word. And therefore, we have a culture that's completely lost and doesn't have any direction and doesn't really know where we're headed. And uh, I can't help but wonder how many of us in this room might fall into the same category to where we feel like we want some things from what God has to offer. We feel like we want some things that, that Christianity has to offer, but you haven't dedicated yourself to what God has to say about your life. And so every single service, we have a time to, for people to reflect and say, how is this speaking to me? What does God want me to know about what was just said? So if you stand to your feet, um, here's the question. Have you dedicated yourself to actually surrendering to Jesus? And that includes, have you surrendered yourself to what he says? And there's no such thing. The world's trying to do it. It's not working. They're trying to surrender themselves to Jesus. They like the idea of a good, fluffy teacher without surrendering themselves to what he said. And you can't separate them. Then that's one of the things that Josh was really bringing forward. You cannot separate a man's words from the man. You cannot separate God's words from the God. And they have to go together. Are you surrendering yourself, God? You know, whatever you say, I'm signing up. I'm yours. I'll let this guide me. I'll let your word save me. I'll let your word dictate my life. Have you given yourself that completely to God? Here's your chance. Um, so if, you, if we can have the prayer partners step up to the front, you decide, what do you want God to say to you this morning? And what is he speaking to you right now? And these guys would love to pray with you and support you as uh, Mike and the music team uh, lead us in this last song.